Well, good morning and happy Easter. You know, on Easter Sunday last year, I was in Malawi and, well, it could not have been a bigger contrast to this year, could it? It was hot, it was humid, it was crowded, it was crazy. And in any other normal year, it would have been a huge contrast to what I'm doing now. But this particular year, well, the difference could not be more distinct. It's a good thing that our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, is unchanging, is consistent, is reliable, is dependable, and is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I'm just going to read to you from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1. And at the beginning of Acts, we've got Luke telling us about some of the things that Jesus said to his followers, to his disciples, after he'd risen from the grave. I'm going to read from Acts chapter 1, and I'm going to start at verse 3 and go through to verse 9. After his suffering, he presented himself to them, and he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They gathered round him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. There was a journalist who worked for the Guardian newspaper a few years ago now, and a Christian friend of his um, noticed that every time he wrote about Christians in the newspaper, it was a, a cynical article. So his friend said to him, would you like to come along to this event? It was um, an alpha introduction, something like that. And he went along, and as a result of that alpha event, he then went along to a big church service. And uh, he goes along, still on a, a real journey of discovery, really. This big, big church. It's Easter time as well. And uh, after he's been there, he says to his friend, he rings him up, he says to him, Hey, I'm worried. His friend says, Well, what are you worried about? He says, Well, last night I went along to one of your, uh, your Christian meetings. One of your services, I think you call them. Anyway, I went along to one of these and I'm worried. His friend says, well, what are you worried about? He says, well, this big meeting I went to, he says, it was one of these, uh, it was very charismatic, very happy clappy, he says. And uh, to tell you the truth, it wasn't that really that I'm worried about. It was who I'm worried about that's bothering me. His friend says, well, what do you mean? He says, well... He says, after that, I'm worried about God. His friend says, well, Matthew, look, you don't really need to worry about God. He says, uh, he's been around a lot longer than we have. He's big enough to take care of himself. Worry about yourself, not God. Matthew says, well, now I'm worried and disappointed. And his friend says, well, why are you worried and disappointed? He says, well, I'm worried about God. I'm still worried about him, but now I'm disappointed in you. He said to his friend, he says, well, you better explain what you mean. He says, well, you know, I thought Christians, when somebody said they were worried, that they, they weren't just supposed to tell the person who's worried, look, don't be worried. It's like saying, pull yourself together. Anyway, I want you to help me with my worry. I want you to tease my worry out of me. I want you to relieve my worry, you know. Don't just tell me not to be. His friend says, okay, why are you worried about God? 
He says, well, I went along to this, this big, big meeting in central London, he says. And there was this, this leader there, lead, this guy leading the meeting. He says, everybody was very, very excited. And he says there was a band, they started playing, and, and the, the leader, he gets things going, he welcomes everyone, he prays a prayer, and, and all the rest of it, and the, and the band starts singing, and, and they were great, he says, they were, they were great, it was very uh, foot-tapping stuff. His friend says, well, what was the problem? He says, well, it was what happened next, he says. He says, what happened next was that there was a woman, and she was on the third row, right at the front, and it was what she did. Well, what did she do? He says, well, well, near the end of the song, they, they did this little pause, he says, and uh, the guitarist still picking his strings, and it's very gentle, the woman on the third row. Suddenly, she stands up, she stretches out her arms, and she says to us all, I am the Lord your God. He says, to tell you the truth, it came as a little bit of a shock. He says, it was something of a shock because, I, to be honest, I was not expecting a personal appearance from the Lord God Almighty, but to find him in the form of a woman on the third row, well, he says, what happened next? He says, oh, it was wonderful. He says, God wanted to reassure us. It, it was like we were a tree. We were planted by a river. Our roots were deep in him. Our branches were spread out. We were, we were bearing much fruit and providing much shade to the passers-by. And the deeper we dug our roots in, the more we would bring some shade and, and some shelter to others. His friend says, wow, well, that's pretty good, he says. He says, I know, he says, it, 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 was, it was very, it was amazing, it was helpful. He says, uh, it's really, really nice that God wants to encourage his people. So his friend says, well, what's your problem? He says, well, after that, the leader gets control of the meeting again, the band switch into a new song, and they're halfway through the song, and, and it happens again. He says, do you mean the woman stood up again? He says, no, this time it was a bloke at the back. And he says, my children, my children, I would speak with you. He said it was incredible. God had swapped seats and had swapped genders. And the most worrying thing is, he says, he'd swapped stories as well. He says, now we were a mighty army marching to war with banners unfurled, invincible. He said it, it kept going on all night. He said, God kept popping up in different disguises. And then he said this. He says, I don't want to upset you, he said to his Christian friend. I don't want to upset you, but your God, he just can't stop talking. He just keeps interrupting. Well, Matthew, his friend says, look, you've got to understand that it, it, it's, it's good to encourage people. God, God is just speaking through them. He's speaking to us through them. I know, Matthew replied. I worked all that out, really. So his friend says, well, what's the problem then? He says, well, the real problem didn't come until later on, to be honest. He says, I was on the tube, I was travelling home, and I sat down in one of the carriages, and as I sat there, I looked across the carriage at the woman sat opposite me. She was in her mid-fifties. He said, head bowed down, long face, empty eyes, hollow cheeks, intimidated, alone. He says, I, I stared up the carriage, and there in the corner was a man, and and this guy was huddled there, he's was, he was a young guy really, head over, head bent down, hood over his face, he, he doesn't want to show his face to anyone, he looked alone, he lost anxious, he looked anxious. And then he says, I look down to the other end and, and there's, there's a bloke, he's drinking from a bottle that's in a paper bag, just a, a man in his forties. Who was he, he said. How did he get like that? And there were some youths when I got off the, the train, he says, they, they were just hanging around, no, no purpose, no, no light in their eye, aimless, just no direction. He said, what happened to these people, he said. What are their stories? Then he said, I, I realised why I was so disturbed at what, I, at what I'd seen and heard earlier on. He says, your God's got a lot to say in private. He can't stop talking, really. Congratulating his flock, he says. But when did he go quiet in public? Why has he got so much to say in private behind closed doors and so little to say where it matters most? It's food for thought, isn't it? It's good really to hear people be as challenging as that. You might not agree with him about God being silent in public. I, I don't agree with him. But it's good for us to be prompted, to be reminded. And in this very peculiar, strange 
worrying and, and difficult time, it's really important for us as a church. It's really important for us as, as individuals, as followers of Jesus, to make sure that our focus stays on track, that we don't lose our way. This journalist guy, Matthew, well, one other thing about him is that he's a social historian. And, and his, his background, that, that's his background, and, and he really knows the story of the church. He knows why cathedrals are at the centre of every city. He knows why the market square is, is in a position dominated by the church building. He knows that the church was at the, the centre and the hub of life. He knows that education began in the church and pioneered education for all and health care. He knows about the development of the arts and the theatre. He knows that the theatre arose out of mystery plays in the church. He knows about the development of art and music. He knows that the centre, he knows that the church was at the hub, the centre of all these things. Actually, actually Matthew is, is a gracious man. And he would not dispute that the church is, is still very involved and that it's doing things and great things are happening providing social care, providing youth work, working with the elderly, working with families, doing this, doing that. There are really, really great things going on. But he would say as a social historian, he would say that at, at one stage the church was at the very hub of the local community, but in many places now it's somewhat marginalised. And he would know exactly why that happened. How it happened really was to do with a movement called the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment began in the 16th, 17th centuries and, and stretched through the 18th, 19th centuries. And the Enlightenment did, did a devastating thing, really. Historians would argue it's the, possibly the second most powerful movement ever to sweep across Europe. The most powerful one being, of course, the church itself. But the way it worked was this. If you could wheel back about 500 years in, in this area, or, or any area, really, it was like this. God was upstairs, we were downstairs. God's in heaven. We're here on earth, he's the boss, we're his servants, God controls things and we do his will. That's the way it is. God and us. And then suddenly, things began to happen. Scientific discovery, which was good. Good, very, very good. For example, along came someone like Isaac Newton, who himself was a Christian. And Isaac said, you know, we've always thought that apples fall down because God makes apples fall down. Well, I've got some news for you. Apples don't just fall down because God makes them. It's that the universe has got a mechanism in it. It's called gravity, and, and that's how God does it. And everybody said, wow, whoa, that's enlightening, the enlightenment. And someone discovered that the earth was round, not flat, and it rotated round its axis. And that caused a little bit more controversy than the apple falling down. But it explained the seasons and sunrise and sunset and it explained the weather. Until then, no one really had questioned how God did it. They were just happy that he did. And they said, wow, that's very enlightening. So it became known as the Enlightenment. But then a new generation rose up. And they said that others had been wrong about hanging on to that view that, that God made gravity and God did these things. They said that God belongs to a primitive worldview. Primitive people believe in God and, and we've grown up now, we've evolved, we've, we've developed, we, we understand the universe now and God doesn't really fit in anymore. He, he's irrelevant. And through the enlightenment process the church really gets pushed into a corner. On one side you've got the public world and the world of politics and the world of science and education and the world of health and medical science and, and social care. You've got that over here, you've, you've got that, and then over here you've got the world of, of faith and values and, and religion. And you could have your private world of religion as long as you didn't, didn't make it public, as long as you didn't take your faith into the public place and you know we've, we've probably all heard it said haven't we by people who say well well that's very good for you isn't it that's very nice for you and, I, and I'm glad you've got those values but but don't bring them on on me have you ever heard that so so these two worlds get divided really and the church is is huddled in a corner don't know whether anybody remembers the, the little song uh, that goes, Jesus bids us shine with a pure, clear light. Anybody remember that one? Uh, it's, it's a real oldie. Jesus bids us shine with a pure, clear light, 
like a little candle burning in the night well you know it might be a traditional one and many traditional songs and hymns of course are absolutely brilliant very very relevant now I'm just not so sure about this one really it's a song of the enlightenment let's tease it out a little bit Jesus bids us shine with a pure clear light well that line sort of tempts us in doesn't it, it makes us think that it's quite biblical Jesus bids us shine with a pure clear light yeah that's right Jesus says let us be lights to the world absolutely then it goes downhill a little bit then it says like a little candle burning in the night over here in the darkness not not out there when God says be lights to the world when God said be lights to the world do you think he meant be a little candle in the corner I think that when God said be lights to the world he meant that we should turn the searchlight of God's love and God's justice and God's compassion and God's hope God's hope turn that on the whole of the world I think that's what he meant back to the song Jesus bids us shine with a pure clear light like a little candle burning in the night he looks down from heaven to see us shine you in your small corner and I in mine we read earlier on from Acts chapter 1 and Jesus when he'd risen from the dead this great event that changes world history it says there in verse 8 doesn't it it says in that passage we heard earlier on he says but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth how private does that sound to you how small corner does that sound to you how retiring does that sound you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth I think that sounds quite public it's time we said that as bringers of hope we do not buy the enlightenment lie we don't belong in our building in our own four walls doing our own thing and, and we've known that we've not been like that we belong by command of our risen King Jesus we belong in the center place engaging with our communities we belong in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and in Tarin High School and in Tarin High Street and in Brink Creek and Clanegrin and Clungwirrell and in, in Fairbourn and Abu Dhabi and in Arthog and in Dolgethai and Barmouth or wherever you live because our task is to bring the searchlight of God's love and God's justice and God's truth and God's hope to every man and every woman and every boy and every girl in every community that's what we're called to do a very interesting thing to note in that passage is when Jesus says to him, says to his friends, he says, wait here, wait here until you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Until you're filled with the Holy Spirit and then go and be my witnesses. In the public place, wait here and be filled with my Spirit, then go and be my witnesses. And in that statement, Jesus holds together he holds together two great truths that he, that he teaches throughout his whole ministry. Wait and be filled with my spirit. Be resourced, be refueled, develop your relationship with me. That's one of the, one of the, the great reasons we, we go along to church, isn't it? To be refueled, to be resourced, to be for God, to, to equip us and enable us. We've got to take in before we give out develop your relationship with me says God that's vital and then go so it's be with me and then go so Jesus taught his disciples this truth time and time again for example in Matthew 22 a young man comes up to Jesus he says sum up please sum up the whole of the law and the prophets and Jesus says it's like this he says love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself love God and love your neighbor 
wait here and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Know me. Have intimacy with me. Then go and get involved. Loving God and loving your community. Intimacy with God and involvement in your community. Intimacy and involvement. It's authentic Christianity. Christian faith. You know, intimacy without involvement, like saying, here I am, Lord. Here I am to worship you again, Lord. Fill me, fill me, just for, for my sake, really. Do great things in my life but, and minister to me. You know, if we have intimacy without involvement, without service, without getting involved, well, that's not getting the right balance. At the same time, involvement without any intimacy is a barren place to be in. You know, we've got to build the church. We've got to work in the community. We're saying, we've got to do this. We've got to do that. We've got to run Alpha. We've got to do food bank. We've got to run youth work. We've got to fundraise. We've got to plan this. We've got to manage that. We've got to do admin. We've got to do finance. We've got to do meetings. We've got to run debt centers. We've got to work with the elderly. Do all this. That could be the place of burnout. Intimacy without involvement is a shallow existence. But equally, involvement without intimacy with God can grind us into the dirt or leaves us cynical or leaves us miserable or discouraged or disillusioned or, or plain tired. Even if you can keep on going somehow like some sort of, like a, like a bulldog, you find you have no hope to bring. Wait here, said Jesus. Be resourced here, said Jesus. Be refueled here, said Jesus, and then go. Because if you go and try and get involved without a filling of my spirit and an intimacy with me, if you, if you go without me, then you've nothing to bring. The greatest poverty in the towns and in the cities and in the villages, the greatest poverty in our streets isn't financial poverty. Although I know there are many communities where there's real, real hardship and real deprivation. But the greatest poverty around today is a poverty of hope. It afflicts those who are financially poor and it afflicts those who are well off. It afflicts those who hang out behind their electric gates and paved driveways as, though, as well as those who live in slums. A lack of hope. Saying, who am I? What direction am I going in? Do I matter? What can I do? What's my life about? Is there any purpose? The greatest gift that we can bring through Jesus living in us is that of inner hope. There may be people watching this today who are struggling because they've lost their inner hope. You look at others and you think, oh, just want to be like them. Your confidence is low. Your self-worth is low. You don't feel accepted. You might even feel rejection. No intimacy with God. Maybe you, you're involved in all sorts of things possibly, but there's a lack of inner hope. Easter Sunday is the ideal reminder that this is what it's all about. The greatest gift we have to bring to others and the greatest gift we have received is that gift of hope because Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus went to death. He died on a cross. He died on a cross for every excluded and downtrodden and forgotten and anxious and discouraged or just simply plain tired person. Some, somebody who feels they, they don't matter. He died for them. For every person who feels like that. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, it's like their hope died. Jesus was laid in the grave for every sinner and every tax collector who was despised. For every struggler and for every anxious person and for everyone who just feels aimless or lacking in hope. Their hopes died with Jesus when he was laid in that tomb. But then, on Easter Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the dead. 
And for every forgotten, abandoned, abused or lonely person, for everyone who felt let down or stolen from or taken from or bitter or forgotten or, or cheated, there was now hope in the universe. There was now hope in their lives. Love is stronger than death. Jesus conquers. That's the hope we have to bring. Intimacy and involvement fit together. They go together. Involvement without any intimacy with God is hopeless. Intimacy without involvement isn't real Christianity because authentic faith finds its wellspring in intimacy with God and in a peace with him and in a hope through Jesus Christ. Intimacy and involvement. Love God and love your neighbour, said Jesus. Be filled with the Spirit and go. Not be filled with the Spirit or go. It's not love God or love your neighbour, you choose, I don't mind. No, the two have got to go together. Well, this Easter Sunday, one other reason that things were going to be quite different was that I was expecting Susie, my wife, and Bethany, and Jake, and Joe, and, and nine young people from our church family to be away in Mexico. And our heart goes out, of course, to those families out there in Tijuana who were so looking forward and so excited by not only our group going, but lots of groups from the UK and America going out to do that much needed house building project. And of course our hearts go out to our group and all the other groups who would have been expecting to go. They would have thought they'd be away at this time. But we're trusting that the right time for that will come. Anyway, what would any bloke do when his wife's going to be away for a while. He'd make sure that he was well stocked up on food, wouldn't he? So he'd be pleased to know that I brought in loads of these. This is it, the pot noodle. Well, this is king pot noodle actually, not just any old pot noodle, but it is the original curry flavor. It is amazing, unforgettable, delicious. I stockpiled upon these. That's before the lockdown started, of course. I got cupboards full of the stuff. Well. Although it is incredible, and it is amazing, you have to admit, 30 minutes after you've had one of those, you're hungry again, aren't you? That's because fast food, quick fix food, doesn't satisfy. Quick fix food doesn't do what it really needs to do for hungry people. The same as just attending church, going through the motions singing the songs, listening to the talks, without getting involved, without serving, that doesn't satisfy. And it leaves you empty again very soon. As well as that, it can actually be quite boring. Dare I say that? Perhaps we need to edit that out later on. Because you know, you can do all sorts of things to try and make church more interesting. You could paint the building a different color or change the hymn books or change the preacher even, sing new songs. Well. If your life is all intimacy but no involvement, it could be quite boring. That's often why some people leave, or don't really get started in the first place, or, or get quite disillusioned. Church, of course, needs to be a place where people are cared for, and protected, and nurtured, repaired even. It needs to be a family, it needs to be a community, it needs to be a support group, it needs to be a learning community as we, we go on a, together. It needs to be a place where people can come and be refueled and resourced and then go out and get involved. The Bible, in fact, doesn't call it boring. When Jesus' brother James was writing about this, he says, faith without works is dead. He didn't say it was boring, he said it was dead. He said it wasn't Christianity. Intimacy without involvement is not ultimately satisfying. Involvement without intimacy is not authentic Christianity. It's, it's a fast track to burnout, really. The Enlightenment lie tells us to go and get in our small corner. A year like the one we're having now, this period of time, well, we have the opportunity to do both, really, don't we? We have the opportunity to take in, to have intimacy with God, to be refueled, re-envisioned, re-energized, but we've also got the opportunity 
to be bringers of light in, in new and quite creative and imaginative ways. Ways that will hopefully continue when everything gets back to normal. Because Jesus is risen. Because Jesus is risen, we can be bringers of hope. We've got that hope to bring. And we balance our intimacy with God, with our desire to be involved and to serve. Be filled with my spirit, says Jesus, and then go. Go and serve. Go and be Jesus to your friends, your family, to your neighbours, to your community. The church isn't really reinventing itself right now, but it's certainly rediscovering, or it certainly has the opportunity to rediscover what it was to begin with. Reaching people and letting them know that there is hope because Jesus is alive.